And, and you can see now why we use this metaphor of shingle to, to describe this writing technique. So what, what I showed previously here, I showed um, five tracks basically in the space of four tracks. And that's approximately the right scale of things. And, but we don't want to do this forever across the whole surface of the disk, which has hundreds of thousands of tracks. Uh, we, we want to break that up every once in a while and, and, and restart the shingling, so, sort of at the, like at the, the, um, the bridge of the roof. Um, and, and so each shingle region uh, most commonly is called a band. So the disk is made up of SMR bands, which is mapped to this linear logical block address space, which, by the way, <coughs> has this conventional mapping with outer radius, outer radii bands being mapped to lower LDAs and inner radii bands being mapped to um, higher LDAs, but there's not a guarantee there. We'll, we'll see uh, a little bit more what the opportunity is here. So we're not quite building these as fast as we're flipping burgers, but, but just about. Um, drive managed is, is the first type of SMR drive. Uh, it autonomously handles all of the vagaries of trying to take an arbitrary right to any set of LDAs and store that so that it's retrievable. Seagate has shipped millions of these, millions and millions of these. Um, but so far, they've all been drive managed drives. To, so the process that we go through, if, if you're trying to up, read, uh, if you're trying to write an arbitrary piece of data, is we first read through the shingle region and retrieve all the old data, and then bring in this new data from the host, um, which may have already been in buffer, may have, maybe it's coming in, but it's already in buffer, we're just doing sort of scattered down operation of, of linking a, um, a set of pointers. So we now have this representation of what needs to be in the shingle region. And then we come back and we rewrite the data with the new data there and the old data being restored. If we stop this process halfway, we have a tracks where the data that has been clobbered and, uh, and the old data, the old customer data is no longer recoverable. Uh, so, so you can appreciate that trying to do a random write can be a lengthy process. The first order thing we do to try to improve the write and write performance, so there's a bunch of models and it's uh, various techniques that are similar to solid state drives. But here's a, here's a simple one, and it's, and it's a reasonable representation, is we'll add a big disk cache. And there was a comment earlier about how big caches are getting on drives, right? There's the DRAMs on drives are now 128 megabytes, 256 megabytes. We're now talking about a cache that's on disk that's tens of gigabytes. And it's persistent. So as soon as the data is on this disk cache, the data is safe from an unexpected power loss. The, the write is coherent from the point of view of the uh, data integrity. Um, what else we get is that by having a big, a big disk cache for information to ingress to, is that by the time we need to select one of the bands to clean, we can hopefully have many commands worth of data that all belong to that same band. So that lengthy process of Rereading all the old data so that we can restore it as part of the write process can be amortized over many, many more, um, many more commands. Um, and, and the next order of improvement is to try to uh, accommodate sequential writes <coughs> with conventional performance. So if we can detect that sequential write is occurring, and if we can wait for all of the data for a shingle band to come in, then we. We don't need to use the start catch. We can just, just go straight to the in store and, and be at disk rates. But there were a bunch of caveats in there. Right? It's not a trivial detection. You have to wait for data to come. So there's a latency period before this starts up. The drive is wondering, is this sequential way to persist, or has it just paused for a moment? So, so, so far, from, far, far from easy. But there are certain advantages. Number one, no changes required. Right? This autonomously handles inside the drive everything to make all current reads and writes work just as they always have in terms of data integrity, but with performance compromises. Now, sometimes the performance is actually faster. Right? We've taken this disk cache and as random writes, writes to random LDAs are coming in. We aggregate them and write them sequentially. We're, we're using log structure journaling mechanism 
to write to that disk cache. And so data for many disparate LBAs are all written in one revolution, say, instead of relatively long seeks, depending on the distance between the LBAs. So it can be extremely effective if you have bursts of random writes. So if you want to do a round robin scheme with deciding which device to write to next, and for a while, for tens of gigabytes worth of incoming data, write to one disk before leaving that disk alone and moving to the next disk, that can work great. Uh, it also works very well when the spatial density is really tight. If, you, if you're only accessing, if primarily you're only accessing a very small logical space, then it's going to tend to belong to a very few number of bands, and the cleaning can be very efficient. Um, and this, this has been extremely effective in what we think of as personal compute, the client market, notebook drives, external USB drives, desktop. This is where the millions and millions of drives are all the So it's great. It works for, it, for its markets. But the challenges are this disk cache is a limited resource. And it takes up physical space. And the more physical space you use, the less there is for the user. Or really because no one's going to buy a 4.9 terabyte drive. It forces us to have higher events. It just makes the product um, lower yielding or later to be become available, or you know, all the various effects of trying to move forward the area of density. That cleaning process from the disk cache to the main store is complex. And there are all these limitations of actually being able to get this right around behavior when you want. We have a lot of customers that say, oh yeah, we're doing sequential writes. SM, your drive manager SMR drives should be just fine for us. And then we hook it up and we find a combination of things. Right? The first of which is what you think of as a sequential write to disk turns out not to be sequential from the disk point of view. And then all the other sundry things of, oh, but the file system is introducing inode updates and um, just, just plenty of challenges of trying to get to parity with the conventional way. So thus we have, that, that, was, that was introduction to drive manage, and here's the rest of the story. As I mentioned earlier, there are different drive types. Um, drive Managed goes to and Post Managed. It's a mouthful, but Drive Managed are these backward, atom backward decompatible autonomous drives. Host Managed is this drive type that uses extensions to the ATA and SCSI and PSX. This is being um, standardized right now. But the Host Managed drives don't do just any reads or writes. It, is, um, it, it only allows within a certain LBA ranges only allows sequential writing. And it doesn't allow reads before data is written. So there are various reads and writes which just systematically fail. It's not a random access, direct access device. So it has a completely new device type identity. And regular code, if it's, well, hey, let's we'll see this device and say, I'm not going to have this device. I don't know what this device is. I've never seen that device code before. So post-aware is the type that this discussion is about. This is the type that Seagate is evangelizing, but this is not a marketing pitch. Hopefully, you'll, you'll feel that way. It's, it's a technical presentation of, of what the opportunities are here. So, this is a superset of the two other types. It, remain, it retains the backward compatibility. So, it uses the dry bench techniques as, as a backbone, as a foundation to deal with um, any, any disparate uh, right that might come in. And it uses the same extension. So by the way, you know, what, what the committees uh, recognize, the standardizations committees recognize, is that there are these multiple different technologies that people wanted to go after. And we decided they're close enough so that we will use exactly the same command sets as much as possible. And so far, that's 100% possible. There's, there are differences in, in some of the models, but it's, it's the exact same commands and fields of data structures. So, we often, these words are so close to each other, people often say exactly the opposite of what they mean. So the way I sort of keep the track in my mind is the host aware is the permissive type and, and the host manage is the resource type. The formal names are host aware and host manage, but I often find, I make fewer mistakes if I call them permissive and restrictive. So the goal is, why, why have another device type? It's to get that performance paired, right? Instead of having 
a noticeably slow and sluggish experience. Maybe you notice it most easily on your desktop, but eventually the data center would see it too. What do we have to do to get to, to have parity with conventional drives? How do we enable the world to consume these higher capacity drives? We're adding, we're adding capacity without adding components, right? We're not going to solid state. So, so it's the cost is very low. We want to keep, we want to minimize the interface changes. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to make it as easy for software to evolve to make use of these. We want these devices to be general purpose and we want to enable the devices to be to cons uh, consumed outside the personal compute space where we've already been successful. How are we going to do this? So first of all, we're going to introduce a concept called zones. All these words, blocks, zones, trunks, blobs, everything's overloaded. We're using word zones in this game. So this LBA space is segmented into zones, and these are a one-one concept. Um, that the host can discover exactly what the zone characteristics of the drive are. Zones have write pointers. The write pointer is the location for sequential writing, and where sequential writing will be fully performed. The host controls the life cycle of the zone. We'll get into that more in just a little bit. Um, and Devices have some key characteristics that will be exposed programmatically as parameters to the interface. So how much, how many different pin points, how many different places you can be sequentially writing and have high performance, and how much random writing can you do and have high performance. We'll get more details there too. So we're, we're returning to the story about the SMR bands. The abstract notion is that a zone is like an SMR band, but there might be differences and you wouldn't know. So maybe zones and bands are one to one. Maybe at for some zones there's two SMR bands per zone. Now, now this is one of the reasons why we may want to do some dynamic, logical zone mapping to physical SMR band mapping. So just we taught you all for decades that OLBA, well, it's been about 25 years, but. In the, in the in the 80s, uh, we were the same same speed throughout the whole of the space. And in the 90s, we started to introduce some technologies that gave us more capacity outside, less capacity per track of data at the inner radius. And and we start to we have now this um, tribal knowledge. It's never been an, an outright contract that low BAs are faster than high BAs. We may we're about to violate this. So um, I would actually caution against. I mean, the experience would be interesting, but I would caution against trying to make performance um, architectures that are based on the expectation of this uh, relationship between LDA and uh, sustained throughput. Uh, so, so zones, there, there are different, just like there are different device types, there are different zone types. Most notably, a device can have conventional zones. They can say, I'm going to give the uh, I'm going to provide some amount of conventional space where there's no particular advantage to sequential writing and there's no write pointer. But the, the new idea are write pointer zones. To have zones that each have their own write pointer and their own state of how they've, how they've been used so far. That state basically looks like this, the little state diagram of every zone driving this brand new out of the factory, every zone is empty. As the zone is written to, it is, it is open and it's being filled. Eventually, it becomes completely full. At any time, a reset write pointer event can occur, which sends it back to the empty state. So it's it's like trim, it's like unmap. There are some specific behaviors of trim and unmap that made us decide to invent um, a new command for this. So. The idea is that if you write at the right pointer, that's the most performant place to write, and the right pointer moves as a side effect of that write. So if you're doing sequential writes, you don't have to, you don't, the host doesn't have to ask where the drive, the, the host doesn't have to ask the drive where the right pointer is, the host knows what the, where the right pointer is. It has moved with the write. Um, if, you, if you do a write that's not at the right pointer, the host is aware the permissive device type is going to handle it. The right pointer may move or may not. It's at the device's uh, uh, prerogative of whether, whether or not to do it. Um, but, but, the, but the right succeeds. 
And this um, the right pointer, the, the reset right pointer operation then sends the right pointer back, puts this zone back into the empty state, and it makes all the LPAs unwritten. So that, like flight trim or a map, if you do a read of an LBA right after you've done a reset right pointer, <coughs> it, the drive will return all zeros or whatever the initialization pattern is. So um, the, you don't have to access the medium, right? but, but the reads will work and they'll work deterministically. You know what data we will get at. Thus, we have two new commands the report zones command and the reset right pointer command. The report zones command is the new command that lets you query the drive and ask what the, the configuration is. For every zone, there's a descriptor. Um, there's a type and a size of the starting LDA, and these are static. There's no configurability. Like when I drive these at factory, this is the configuration for type and size and the, and the starting point. Each zone has a state and, and a, uh, a current value of its state and a current value of the right frame. So if you need to sync up after a power cycle or some exception event, you query the device to ask, um, to ask where the right frame is. You can, you can ask based on, you, you can filter this based on um, certain states. You can ask just for a list of the empty zones or a list just of the full zones. There's also a shortcut here for the same file. Um, so if you, if, if you receive a report zones with the same, the same flag set, the drive is telling you all of the zones are the same type and size. So this is what we consider to be a general purpose configuration is for all zones to be the same size. That, a, that software doesn't have to keep track of uh, a disparate number of, uh, of every zone possibly being a different size. And what we think is a useful size is 256 megabytes. Uh, this, or more specifically, video. This number was selected so that the amount of space needed to isolate zones from each other is well below a percent, as far as we can see. But it's a number that you've discovered programmatically, like, um, like the capacity of the product. Um, so it, you, you think the only thing that's really useful is for this to be a power of two and for it to be as small as practical. And that number seems to be 256. Uh, the reset right pointer, I, I already talked about this command. Uh, you, you specify a zone, that zone goes back to the key. There's a special flag that says reset all. So if you're about to repurpose the drive, completely rebuild the file system, you can, you can just issue reset all. Um, I talked about device capabilities. So there's two parameters that you can create the device for, uh, either through an ATA log page or a SETI by a product data page. There's an open zones number. The full formal name of it is the mouthful optimal number of open zones, like preferred zones. Um, this, this indicates how many zones have an active, fully performant write pointer. So every, every write command that's coming in, the drive is checking the starting LBA against the write pointer. Now, with 256 megabytes per zone, a 10 terabyte drive has tens of thousands, almost 40,000 zones. And most devices will not, probably will not be able to have the tens of thousands equally performing. So we're, we're right now going out to the market, and please give me feedback if you have a different view. Uh, 100, we've heard that tens are not enough, thousands are probably not needed, so our current design target is 128. So it's possible that we may want to consider the number of metadata slides, or meta slides, if I understand the concept properly, to be 128 per drive, or to be equal to this number when you query the drive and ask what this value is on that drive. The other value that's of interest is how much random writing can you do? That is the data, the LDA space mass. And the, the unit of measure here, again, is its own. So uh, in a host query drive, the host doesn't have to tell the disk which zones are going to be randomly write. You can select any zones in the LDA space. Any of the tens of thousands can be randomly written. But not all of them, if you still want to have super performance. So how many? This number, which we think is going to be 60. So again, give us some feedback. But it means, for instance, in a, uh, in a more conventional system, if you wanted to have um, 
Uh, a 10 terabyte drive, each file system had no more than one terabyte, so you have 10 partitions that each file system can have a zone for which random overwrite updates for its own metadata. And, and this will work. They don't have to all be using the first 10 zones of the They can be anywhere in the old basis. How can you tell if you have one of these devices? I, I mentioned earlier that the restrictive host managed has a completely different device type. But this host aware is a slightly different device than existing devices. So you can tell with these special flags. In, in SPESM, there's going to be an HAWZC flag in the, um, in the in this block device characteristics page. I think it stands for host aware zone block names. And in HA there will be a feature flag for this thing. So the intended usage model is start off by issuing reports on this one. Find out what the zone configuration is. Um, and if you find out that not all zones are the same size, maybe you want to reject that and say, oh, that, that's a niche market device. Maybe, maybe there's some niche markets for, I don't know, for surveillance, for deep archive, for, for something where there's good reason not to have all the zones the same size. But I, I think it would be perfectly fine to say for a general purpose file system, all zones should be the same size. <coughs> Then limit your random zones. Use, use random zone, uh, uh, allocate zones to be randomly written as needed. Limit it, if you can, to that advisory parameter. And, and for your random zones, the right pointer may be doing things that are hard to predict, but you don't care. You're never going to issue a set pointer, reset the right pointer, I presume, because I don't think these zones are going to tend to ever get to the state where all the data is stable. Um, so, so, the, so the expected usage model is just pick some zones and do your random writes them. The rest of the zones use them for sequential writing. So in these, the right pointer is implicitly known. And again, you don't need to issue except, uh, you don't need to issue report zones with any frequency. Control how many zones are open. That is, they'll either be empty or full, and a few will be open. And so limit that to that advice you know, say 128 different dependent points in the graph. Now, if you have a, if you have an application that is filled once, if you're if you're in a, um, a cloud storage application that is storing um, storing data that nobody ever wants to throw away. Facebook tells you they'll never throw away your data. Exxon's going to go up to North Dakota and pump the ground and get seismic feedback to decide where to frack next. And they're never going to throw that data away. That data was really expensive to come up with. Financial records are not going to be thrown away, or at least not for the life of the drive. Right? Maybe after some years you throw away the drive and can't it. But for those systems, trying to reuse space may not be a big deal. But for, um, for other systems, you, you may want to reuse your space. And if you want to reuse your space with this high sequential write throughput, you need to have some kind of garbage collection. So instead of just doing pull filling, maybe there is a different kind of notion of defragmentation. It gets a whole 256 meg span. Right? So maybe your, your fragmentation score is um, empty, and, empty zones are 0% frag, and full zones are 100% frag. And there's not much in between. So here's the resources. You can get a hold of me. Uh, the, sh the short form is Feldman at Seagate.com. We have sample drives available. Um, we've announced RA terabyte drives, and, uh, and they will be host aware variants of that, and samples are available. Um, performance will get iteratively better over, over the uh, next coming months and quarters. The standards bodies uh, websites have the current. Uh, uh, current drafts of the specifications, the study stuff is going to go to ballot, let it out soon. Uh, and let me, let me say that there are some uh, there are some extensions that I didn't mention here that just got approved uh, last week. So so it's a little more complex than I told than, than I described, but uh, that's good to try to keep the time short. Um, HGST has put some user space libraries so people can start playing around with this with some uh, emulation. The SCSI layer components of Linux, there are some initial improvements that have gone into open source and so we can grab those. 
and uh, consider coming to a new conference, the Linux Foundation is going to have the first of which is next March in Boston, the Linux Fall. And back to the conclusion slide. Uh, the call to action is to consider what does it take to bring ZFS up to the point where it could be a highly performant general purpose file system for these kinds of devices. Thanks. Shut down, and we make those things uh, 
parameters that are driving these posts. We may find that the market just settles on a certain set of parameters that everyone accepts as being good parameters, and then every driver will have the qualities that the drive being replaced will have. But it's too early in the technology to know if that's going to happen. Yes, yeah, so the question is about kinetic drives. And kinetic is a drive that uh, Seagate announced uh, the architecture a year ago, and we just announced the availability of the first drive last week. It is a drive that is Ethernet connected, and the interface is not a block interface, but a key value interface. So you, 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 you do look at delete right to the drive. And the next generation kinetic drive, which will be available next calendar year, is going to be based on, it'll be HR right, based on SMR. And this is an opportunity for the drive manufacturer to hide all of these things. So if you want to write a file system to a key value object, which some file systems, uh, file services, such as Seth, for instance, already do, now you can, you can just buy this key value device. Um, and, and, and so we have a team inside Seagate that is going to take on all these challenges that I just exposed to you and solve it for the device that we are going to ship. The rest of that is another half hour or one hour talk. Yeah. Yeah.